Now, wine accessories. Most of them are pretty useless, to be honest. We did a video recently on this where we really did struggle to be able to give you uh, more than about two or three different things that you could buy that would add to your overall experience in enjoying wine. But one of them that we did cover uh, was the Coravin. Uh, now this is the Coravin Pivot. This is their sort of more entry level or more service oriented uh, product. Um, but I'm fascinated and always have been fascinated with the ability for Coravin to be able to enter the sphere of wine with something that is technologically quite advanced and actually contribute to another, you know, I guess a human being's connection to place and land through wine, uh, but incorporating something quite technologically advanced. And so I got in touch with Greg Lambrecht, the founder of Coravin, who graciously uh, fit us in his very, very busy schedule to have a bit of a chat as to how he came up with the idea, uh, where it's going to from here, and sort of some of his sort of like thinking patterns around the concept of invention uh, and how he enjoys wine. And what I discovered was a, an exceptionally passionate, exceptionally intellectual individual who uh, obviously knows the wine industry inside and out has uh, and managed to, uh, I guess, contribute to it in a way that I don't think really many before have, have really contributed. Um, but anyway, enjoy the conversation. I particularly uh, took a lot away from it. Um, and I've got to say, I'm probably going to end up using my Coravin a lot more these days. Um, but enjoy the conversation. You'll absolutely love what he has to say. Awesome. Uh, Greg, thank you so much for, for giving us the time. Seriously, I, I know you're a really busy person. Truly, truly a pleasure. I have, I have two lives. I've got the Corbin life and I've got my medical life. Tonight is medical life. So uh, yeah. how do you juggle it? How do you, how do you, is it just really good scheduling? Do you have a good app hack for it? <laughs> no, it's great spouse. Um, she does all my planning for me. Uh, all of the flights, all the, I'm, blessed uh and then passion i love both of the things that i do both of them are my company so if, if i if i didn't love them it's my fault right but uh it turns out that i do love them wine is great spine surgery is great you know i i enjoy my life i gotta ask though in all of my research the thing that came up that i just i just can't can't get around why you didn't just stick with wine mosquito because it's just too perfect <laughs> it was uh the name that my son gave it when he was three years old and i gotta tell you it was a knockdown drag out fight to change the name uh when the company was founded it was actually founded as wine mosquito inc and uh yeah no joke and believe it or not i was able to raise money around that name um and and people invested and those investors were like you know we've got to change the name it's mosquitoes right you know they're they cause itchiness they can kill people yeah. um malaria malaria we've got to make a change uh we can't sell malaria to the people and so uh you know but people were like no it's sticky leave it um but you know ultimately everybody sort of came to their senses we found a great name and and so and how, we how did that name come about? What was the Coravin? Uh, I mean, half of it is that I'm a Latin nerd. Uh, I'm a nerd in general, uh, but I studied Latin in school and I uh, work in medicine and core is the Latin word for heart. And uh, getting at what? the heart of wine was what we wanted to do. And it's, for me, it's variety. You know, it's, there are a few beverages on this planet that have such insane variety uh, as wine. I think it's, I think it's why doctors are so interested in it. It's something that they never get bored of. I've never gotten bored of. Um, there's 140,000 different wines bottled every year, and they change every year they're in the bottle, and they change when the winemaker's son or daughter takes over. And, and you know, it's there's an infinite exploration that's possible. So that's that's the story that, that we stick with about its creation. But the name actually, I was standing in Hong Kong, with my CEO at the time, and he gets a cell phone call. We're trying to decide on a name, and all of them had been trademarked or whatever. We couldn't use them. And he, he looks at me and he goes, "Greg, uh, what do you think about Coravin?" It's like, "Oh, that's great!" And he goes, <laughs> "We'll take it." And he like hangs up. And I still don't know who's on the other line. <laughs> well, it's it's kind of funny you sort of mentioned the diversity of the wine industry and just how much consumer choice there is. Uh, recently, we did a, a video on wine accessories. So all, all the extra shit that you can pile in, you know, aside to wine, and there's not the same amount of diversity. There seems to be a big disparity between 
it's almost like wine is all uh, so complex itself that it kind of doesn't need accessories. Um, and so it caused or sparked a lot of debate internally as to, well, what would we recommend as an accessory? It was undoubted that Coravin was a part of it, but I'd say, you know, prior to Coravin, there was probably a solid 70 year gap between another sort of accessory that would be worthy to have within the repertoire of any kind of wine connoisseur or wine lovers collection. Was it hard to get that into the minds of, of the sort of literati at the time, the gatekeepers to try to get Coravin and say, like, hey, this thing's actually worthy? Because we're given a sea of just crappy accessories all the time that don't really contribute to the experience, whereas Coravin is undoubtedly one of the most useful ones. It, it was hard, um, but it took planning. And I, I think, like with anything hard, if you set out a plan with a goal and you execute on it, you've got a chance. Uh, without a plan, you're, you're just relying on luck. And, and so the, the thought was early on, okay, um, we're new to this field. Uh, this is a product that's never existed before. And certainly the scale of preservation has never existed before. We've got to go to the top of the pyramid. And the top of the pyramid were the winemakers uh, in the wineries. We're going to use our product on theirs. And we thought if we launched without them knowing what it was, they would see it in a restaurant and go, what the heck is that? You know, what are you doing to my wine? Um, so we started with the winemakers doing blind tastings with them before we launched. We started with the top restaurants. Uh, in New York, uh, the UK, San Francisco, um, Paris, uh, all over Germany, ultimately Sydney, uh, Tokyo, Hong Kong. And we, we basically introduced them to Corb and then did blind tastings with them as well to convince them of its use. And then press. And I was lucky enough to run into two key people that made a big difference. One was Chef Jose Andres. Um, who a friend of mine became a friend uh, was working with, and I got introduced to him, and I, I was like, "No video, sir. We haven't launched yet." And of course, Jose is like, "Screw that!" He takes videos, and it's on the it's on the web immediately. And then Robert Parker, uh, who at the time was the preeminent wine raider, and he said almost exactly the same words you did. He was like, "You know, when I first met him, a friend introduced me, and we were having dinner together, and he just comes in and says, Mr. Lambrecht." Uh, wine accessories are crap. They're meaningless. They get in the way. Uh, I'm sorry, but I'm not going to like what you have. Um, and then he sat down and I showed him what it was. And, and he was like, this is the best thing that's happened since the wine glass. And uh, I was like, can you say that on tape? Yeah, um, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> he posted on a video. We did a video together on YouTube. It's still our, probably our best watch. And all of that before we launched um, had a very positive impact. It's still hard. I mean, it's not all wine regions came around. The Bordeaux producers were like, you know, go away. Um, Burgundy was wide open and, and, you know, loving and affectionate. And so was California and Australia uh, was the same thing. So, you know, I got to learn about launching a new product. I got to learn about changing behavior. And I got to learn a lot about differences in culture um, around the world. I mean, there's a, every culture reacts differently to a change, a, a forced change in behavior or an option to change behavior. And, uh, and I really, I mean, it's a pretty blessed position to be in as the inventor of Orima, especially not as a, anything but a wine lover, uh, to be able to travel the world and see all these great places and meet all these amazing people. But changing behavior is hard. Still doing it. Well, what was it? Was, was that the first time that you had met Robert Parker? I uh, was, yeah. And in, and in that first conversation, he was just that direct with you. It was like, I'm probably, he basically anchored you to not liking it. He's pretty quick, right? I mean, I think it's why he's such a successful wine raider was, you know, he, I had, a, I brought a bottle of 2003 Chapoutier Le Mille Blanc, you know, a white Hermitage that was old from a hot year that I'd Corbin like seven years ago. And I knew he liked it because he's the one who got me to like it. I, who would drink uh, an expensive bottle of white Northern Rhone wine unless somebody told him, hey, this is great. And so, uh, you know, I loved it. And, and so I poured it to him and he was like, yeah, I had this yesterday. I, I know this wine really well. And I was like, yeah, I Corbin did seven years ago. And that's, that's when he changed. Right. It would have been a little bit different had you put, you know, Jacob's Creek Chardonnay uh, in front of him, I'm sure. <laughs> I suppose that you, you obviously are a wine lover. Like to yeah. be able to select a wine of particular provenance, knowing that it's a hot year, knowing that 
for all intents and purposes, this wine should not look as good as it does. And that's the sort of hook, I think, you know, with someone like Robert Parker, who's obviously it's respect, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, he, you, you have people that love and hate him. He's a, he's a friend now. And, and uh, you know, I just, just had lunch with him uh, three weeks ago. Um, you know, he, he's loved and hated, um, like anybody that's influential is, you know, because people blame him for changing the wine market. And, but, you know, he's... He changed the wine market, right? There was no more powerful critic in any field. You know what? The second digit in his rating was the ten dollar digit of your of your wine, right? Correct. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. It put Australia on the map. I mean, it also killed Australia yeah. in many respects. But you know, since we've got, I suppose, a new generation of drinker um, arising, we're sort of seeing this sort of amazing transition from you know, the, you know, he's he's become a, a, a descriptor, hasn't he? You know, parkerized yeah. wines. Well, I mean, so so have you. I mean, you've changed wine for the better. I mean, I encountered the Coravin the first time, I reckon, in 2014 when I was working in Barolo. We went to a restaurant in La Mora, and I was a wine student, and I was just, a, a you know, doing a, a stage there. Uh, and the fact that I could cherry pick through the list without having to pay two, yeah. three hundred euro a bottle and get a glass and a taste and, you know, absolutely incredible. I do wonder if there's going to be like, uh, you know, like Coravin was invented at this date, and then you just saw everyone's education like level go like up and up and up and up you know it's just to give us access right I, that's it you know for me it was a learning tool um that was why i invented it i was i was at home i had 30 different bottles of wine from different surgeons around the world and that had given them to me to celebrate the first implant of whatever it was and these were really good bottles and they all said you know these are too good to drink right <laughs> they're, they're the best of our country i like first of all that doesn't that doesn't make sense like it was made to be drunk um, but I, you know, my wife at the time didn't like wine very much and, and I wanted to be able to taste them all side by side. You know, I didn't want to open them, not knowing whether they were ready, not mm -hmm. knowing whether they would go well with whatever I was drinking, um, or eating. And I wanted to be able to learn faster than opening a bottle implied. When you open the bottle, you're stuck drinking that bottle. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's fine when you've got friends over or when you really love that wine and you know, it's the perfect night for it. But when you're trying to learn about wine, committing to a full bottle, I mean, you wind up going to these shows where people have tons of open bottles and tons of people, right? And I, I work a real job and I do medicine. You know, I, I travel all over the world. I don't have, I can't make it to these shows. I wanted to learn faster. And uh, Corvin was really the solution for myself and my own house. It's interesting, you know, you mentioned the, the, the 750 mil bottle is a bit of a, a hurdle to try to get over because you have to open, obviously open the 750 mil bottle. Um, you know, a lot of those come at great cost. Uh, the wine industry has been struggling at the moment with trying to transition to different packaging format. It, it is still quite a, a conservative industry in that respect. Like we're still using the glass bottle. Being able to move away from that's going to become, you know, it is very, very tough. The Coravin seems to be this sort of almost novel answer to that without actually having to change the bottle. Have you ever considered Coravin as being the answer to alternative packaging? Oh, you know, uh, I think about this a lot. Um, you know, I think about next innovations that we could do. The wine industry struggles with alternative packaging because glass and cork or glass and screw cap are really good. I and mean, they will last 100 years. Uh, and more. I mean, I've had wines from the 1700s. Uh, and, and so, you know, plastic is permeable to oxygen, so it gets through. Most plastics are permeable to light. Um, cans uh, have liners that are, that are subject to sulfur and to acids. Don't work with every wine. People are trying. Um, it's a tough problem to solve, knowing that I've tried, I've tried to solve it myself. And uh, it it's hard. I do think ultimately the problem that 750 has is that you buy it by the bottle and you drink it by the glass. Well, yeah. And so, you know, you got to, you got to break that bottle down in some way mm -hmm. to, to make sense. I mean, the 750 milliliters is, this is what I was told at, uh, at Barry Brothers and Run in London by a guy who I had deep respect for, no longer there. And he said, you know, the, the volume of 750 comes from the lung volume of a glass blower in the 17th century in the United Kingdom, South Shore, right? He was bottling port. 
<laughs> and so it doesn't make sense. It's it's sort of like why rail rails are the same are a particular width. Mm-hmm. It, it has no rational. It doesn't. It it has no rational um, uh, inception it application. Doesn't. Like like everything else was iterative from there, wasn't it? So we built the yeah. you know uh, pallet sizes. We built shipping containers, and everything sort of like fits within this sort of spectrum, doesn't it? But you're right. Yeah, the bottle that you right? you buy and what you consume is is there's a disparity there. Yeah, which you guys have tried to answer actually with the single serve um, uh, vials. We did, uh, and we are. Um, It's a market that doesn't exist yet, but we came up with this new system called Vinitas that allows a winery to. And actually, in Australia, it's because your laws are a lot more lax, which is great. Uh, Some some wine stores and distributors can do this as well. But uh, break a bottle down into um, smaller bottles. Right now, we're working with hundred milliliter. We could do fifty. We could do one eight seven five all in the same machine. And it allows you to sort of multiply the impact that that one bottle will have on the industry as a wine producer. And these poor guys are shipping, especially from Australia, shipping heavy glass bottles all the way to wherever to get their wine sampled. Uh, and then when they get sampled, the, 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 the press or the wine store takes like a 50 milliliter sip and then dumps the rest. It's tragic. Uh, and so we developed a system to try to try to allow try before you buy in a rational way. And, um, and we're still in the iterative phases with this new technology. It's another change in behavior, uh, this time for the winery. Um, and it's, it's going pretty well, but as, as you said, you know, this is a slow to change market. I, um, wondering about like Corbins themselves because, or, you know, the entire technology is not let's say it's not the cheapest, but it's also not the most expensive either. It's quite appropriately priced. In fact, in, in many cases, I think uh, some of the tech is underpriced. But is the actual profit for Coravin a little bit like, like Gillette razors, a little bit like you know electric toothbrushes? Is it, is it in the canisters? Is that where the sort of money is made for you guys? It's a, it's a combination. Um, we make money on the system and we make money on the capsules. I, I don't like the idea of a loss leader where you sell, you give something at less than your production cost and then you're hoping to make it up in the back end. Um, so we, we make money on both and it's about the same. We've been dropping the price of the capsules year over year, both through cutting our costs uh, because we're ordering millions of these things, yeah. um, but also because I want... I want it to get it down to my goal is a buck a bottle, um, right? If if you can spend a dollar to preserve the first three to four glasses of the bottle um, and then pull the cork and drink the rest, a dollar a bottle seems reasonable to preserve a bottle of wine, right? Uh, indefinitely to whenever you want it. And so we've, we've forced the price down and taken a hit a little bit on our own margin um, to be able to achieve that goal. I do look at Corvin's success in terms of, Initially, it was systems sold. Now it's capsules sold because capsules imply the usage. And so the, the, the metric that I look at is I know we've served over 300 million glasses of wine using Corvin in our 10 years. Uh, and, and that, you know, to me, when I decided what careers I wanted to do, I, I wanted to positively influence as many people as I could. And that's why I work in medicine. And in wine, I look at each glass that somebody pours through a core of and as, as, as a positive influence on that person's life one way or the other, right? They're, they're sharing it with friends or they're enjoying it on a relaxing evening. And so that's 300 million plus and growing experiences mm. that are happening. So I, that, that's that wild. part of it. Yeah, it's great. For a company that's actually quite young, like well, relatively 10 years, speaking. 10 years. In the wine industry, we're young. In the tech industry, we're ancient. Of course. No, of course. Well, what about the different iterations of Corbin? So, because I tried, I'm, I'm looking to actually buy some at the moment. Um, and obviously there's the, um, the pivot, which is yep. outrageously good value. Um, we actually trialed the pivot for 10 weeks. Um, and it really, we would still, I mean, it, it certainly was, the wine wasn't showing its best, but yep. it certainly was drinkable, 100%. Yep. Truth be told, we didn't trial it for 10 weeks. We trialed, wanted to trial it for the, the state, and I think it was like four weeks. We kind of forgot about it. Um, <laughs> and we came, we came back to it. We're like, actually, it's not too bad. Um, but like, what are the, the different sort of iterations between the different units? Yeah, we've got Pivot, Timeless, Sparkling. Um, mm-hmm. And so 
most of my inventions actually come from a guy named Lou who runs the restaurant Stunned Mullet uh, north of Sydney. And so, uh, oddly, most of my inventions since the original Corbin have come from that guy. Uh, we get we get relatively few sheets to the wind. The last night down in Australia, it's a tradition of ours uh, where we gather together with a bunch of wine people and we drink. And he complains. And I, I love his complaints because they drive innovation. So Pivot is uh, works with any stopper. Um, pours really fast, takes no training, and is super efficient with gas. Um, trying to address any reservations that people had about Corbin Timeless, the original system we worked with. The reason it works is because you remove the cork and replace it with a stopper, uh, or you remove the screw cap, or you remove the vena lock, or you remove the plastic cork, or whatever it is. With a tea top in uh, sherries uh, and scotches, uh, tequilas, and people are using Pivot on everything. Uh, and so, you know, you, you place the stopper and then we use this big tube instead of a needle. We still displace the wine using argon, which protects the wine from oxidation. But the stopper isn't perfect. So the wine, the only downside is the wine lasts four weeks. We're working on that. Um, I would love to be able to, and I see a path toward launching a stopper that could last years. Um, why not? And so uh, we're, we're working on that now. So pivots are our low cost lowest cost system and it's very effective for most people pours a glass in a few seconds uh which is which is great great for restaurants um yeah. and then timeless which is the original corbin in here uh it's got a needle passes through the cork um displays the wine using argon uh, wine can last for years uh i've the longest i've done is 20 years I did a blind tasting in London recently with a Thorn Clark Shiraz from 2002 that had been Coravined 19 years prior and, and wow. served this to Jancis Robinson. Uh, you know, that was, I was nervous. Um, yeah, and it did really well. So uh, Coravin is essentially as good as the cork. The time was the last indefinitely. And then Sparkling. Um, sparkling, we launched during the pandemic like Pivot. And it's changed the way I drink wine. Um, I used to talk about, you know, committing to a bottle. You open a bottle of sparkling, it's going to go flat mm. and oxidize. And so we mm. came up with Corbin Sparkling, which, like Pivot, you remove the cork like you normally would, pour like you normally would, stopper the bottle, and pressurize. Um, the wines are lasting because of the materials and the stopper and the way the stopper works. The wines are lasting at least a month. Um, Mo and Hennessy, who were the official preservation system for um, it says it lasts three months. And I just opened my first one that was out a year. It was an English sparkling. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a great system. And I, I now have six bottles of sparkling open at all times. I'm drinking champagne or a glass of sparkling every day. Um, cause it makes me that's happy. wild. Yeah, that's it. Those are our systems. The, how long does the cork sort of like the integrity of the cork sort of last? How many times can I pierce the cork? It depends on the quality of the cork. I mean, we, the vast majority will last at least the five times that most people will do it. Um, the people that test it the most are uh, distributors and importers who want to sample people on their wines. And they're corvening 20, 25 times um, an ounce of pour. And so that, you know, the longest test I've done is 24 punctures uh, with a magnum out a couple of years. And it did really well. But it's very cork dependent at that point and usage dependent. Um, timeless, there, there's three things, four things that really make wine last uh, with Coravin. First is clean it. Uh, it's amazing. A lot of people have never washed their Coravin. And, and I'm like, it's like a wine glass. You wash your wine glass. It's not a corkscrew. And people think of it as a corkscrew, but you wash it. You just pour hot water through the spout and that cleans out any. Britannomyces or Saccharomyces and let grow in there, Acetobacter. Otherwise, you're injecting that into your next bottle. So clean it. Uh, clear it. Clearing means to sparge the system or fill the system with argon before you push the needle through. Quick press the trigger like that, and then push it through the cork. Make sure that the first thing that goes into that bottle is not oxidized wine or, mm. or air. It's argon. And so mm. uh, if you access the bottle multiple times and it's not clean and you're not clearing, you're injecting worse and worse things over time. And then cellar, keep the cork wet, store it on its side. Um, important for longevity. The other thing that I do is check the cork. I'll wrap my hand around the neck of the uh, bottle and press down with my thumb. If the cork slides, 
So the court's not going to yeah. endure quorming. And so that's where I switched to pivot. <laughs> the right. court's failing to pivot. So are there closures that you guys have developed that would actually simply replace the cork? Yeah. The pivot, um, I also have one here. Sleep. So uh, this, is a, this is the pivot that I'm holding. It's, it's a system with a big tube uh, and a spout, a little button for argon, using the same capsule we use. And then it's got this stopper that fits into a bottle. Uh, and this stopper is made of a material that's oxygen impermeable. Uh, and so, you know, you pass the tube through, tip it sideways, press the button, argon goes in, wine comes out of here flows super fast and this stopper is reusable lasts right. indefinitely you just wash it between bottles tap it uh when you're done with your pour uh so yeah i'm i'm trying to work on the perfect closure uh, we used the materials that we discovered for pivot because not all materials are oxygen permeable i am a nerd and we found this material that uh doesn't allow oxygen through really at all and we right. now use that in our Corbin sparkling stopper. Uh, that's why we're getting to a year with that system. So I, I think we can learn. We, can, we took what we learned from Pivot and put it into our sparkling stopper. I want to take what we've learned from our sparkling stopper and put it back into Pivot and get the wine going out a year with our stopper, which would be great. One thing every time I use a Corbin, I, um, I, I can't get it out of my head. And I, w- I want you to lay rest to this because when I'm injecting gas into a glass bottle, I just have this thought that it's going to explode in my hands. Is that <laughs> like a real fear? Uh, yeah. So we pressure limit all of our systems to one and a half atmospheres. So you can hold the trigger forever. And there's a little thing on the inside of the Corbin bottle regulator. And the regulator, no matter what the pressure coming in to the regulator, it'll output the same, no matter what. So one and a half bar, that's it. A wine bottle can take eight to 10 bar. So the odds that it's going to break are exceedingly, exceedingly low. The only way that a bottle is broken is if it's been previously dropped and cracked, but not Mm. shattered. And then if you add pressure to that bottle, the bottom normally pops off or wherever it hit the ground. So uh, it's an exceedingly rare event. It's like one in a hundred thousand bottles. So we've actually, you know, there, there's little sleeves on the inside of the box um, that people could put around their bottle if they're worried. I've never had one break. You, you know, Corbin's like 40,000. Do you have like a pretty robust legal department for that kind of thing that advises on it? No. Um, it turns out that glass breaks. Uh, and a one in a hundred thousand risk of glass breaking is right around <laughs> the risk of getting injured by a bottle of wine without Corbin. And so, uh, yeah, it's well, well, aside from uh, like people putting dirty Corbins or unclean Corbins, you know, across different wines and contaminating them. What are the common mistakes that you've heard about? Oh, it's clean, clear cellar, right? It's uh, thinking the bottle has to be upright. It doesn't. Uh, it's not cleaning it. It's not pressing the trigger when you go in. That's about it. Um, it's it's pretty rugged. I think other things you can do are break the needle uh, mm-hmm. with the with the original core oven. Um, a lot of people, well, some people that break the needle will will hold the capsule cup when the system is through the cork. They'll grab instead of holding the bottle, they'll grab here. Uh, they'll hold the capsule, mm-hmm. capsule cup, lift up the bottle. And that'll break the needle. Mm. So um, that's about it. Uh, We try to get better in our training. I try to do more videos. You're going to see more on Corvin and my Instagram live uh, or Instagram. uh, All my tips and tricks that I give to folks. When we uh, do these sort of interviews, we go out to the rest of the um, our followers and also on our Discord group and you know field any kind of questions. And one of the ones that you know we got a lot of comments on was. uh, talking about how argon basically mutes a wine, you know, preventing it from being able to, to develop in, in sort of exposure to oxygen. How do you advise sort of going about sort of allowing the, the wine to continue to develop after it has been corrobined? Yeah. Um, so the wine in the bottle uh, is absolutely unaffected by the argon gas. Argon is one of the noble gases. It uh, has no known chemical reactions uh, except in the center of the sun. So uh, it, you know, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't influence anything 
Um, so the wine, actually, we've done tests of quorum and non quorum. That's how we do our blind tastings out to years. The wine poured in the glass, when you tip the quorum and when you tip the bottle back up, you'll hear this little sound. That's extra argon coming out of the bottle. Venting. Right. And so if, you, if that sits on top of the wine in your glass that, and you don't move the glass, that argon will actually prevent air from getting right. to the wine. And so uh, as soon as you start to drink from the glass, that argon spills out like a fluid. And so what I find when people say it smells muted or it seems muted is it's normally their first smell because they're essentially breathing in argon uh, mm. that has been sitting on top of the wine. It's not dangerous. It's part of the air we're breathing um, in general. But uh, give the glass a swirl, right? Take a sip and, uh, and that argon will fall out. What about within the bottle? Does it, does it slow down the maturation within the bottle? It does not. And um, we've done tests uh, out for years. And blind tasting is truly humbling. And anybody who feels like their wine has been muted really should have a friend pour them a triangle test of the wine that has been Coravin and another bottle of the same wine. They don't know which mm. of the wines has two glasses. Um, it's a one in six random chance of guessing correctly. And we've done this test with now over... 800 wine professionals from three months out to one month out to 20 years and uh the results are the same people can't tell how we're equivalent to random that's amazing yeah it's it's part of the the two big barriers with wine professionals were proving that it worked because there's so much crap out there that doesn't and then why would you need it demonstrating the reasons mm -hmm. and the ways that it could be used because not all the behavior not very few of the behaviors before Coravin enabled them existed and so you gotta you gotta train both and so we've done a lot of work with wine producers blind tasting their own wines in order to validate it and and those sommelier and all those restaurants all around the world i'm doing it again in tokyo hong kong seoul uh and osaka in a couple of weeks it was, it was funny. It was one thing I was talking to uh, another winemaker about who was very, very loves Corbin, Um and uh, answering one of these sort of comments about, um, obviously, if you are taking wine out and leaving argon on top of the wine, uh, it's not going to be interacting with oxygen anymore. So if you actually want the wine to continue to mature, to put it actually on its side, because yeah. the argon is now sitting on top of the wine in the shoulder. He is and technically... Right. He's right. He is, he is right. Um, if you want the wine to evolve exactly the same as a, another bottle that is on its side, it's best to store it on its side. Because then the environment's the same, right? Air is contacting cork, cork is contacting wine. Uh, whereas yeah. if it's upright, the argon is sitting there. And who knows what's going to happen? <laughs> exactly. So it was sort of ironic. He said, uh, you'd almost say that it could mature slightly quicker because it's the same amount of oxidation potentially with a compromised cork um, with less volume. Uh, so on one hand, we've got it doesn't mature. And the other hand, yeah, it matures, but potentially slightly quicker. Um, you know, whether, whether or not that's material uh, is still sort of, you know, out to, to the jury. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It seems. But, but you do recommend that if, if you do want to see that wine still mature uh, the at the same way. or similar rate. Yeah. Every single core system, sparkling, pivot, and timeless, I advise cellaring on the side. Interesting. It's, and that's not so, like, even the pivot with uh, the capsule. Yep, everything. And I think it's because of that environment thing where, you mm -hmm. know, whatever the stopper is, is contacting wine and con contacting air. What about, because I, mean, I was thinking that the most obvious or the, the, the ways that I see uh, Coravin have been used are all the ways that, that you've, um, you know, spoken about from, particularly with sales reps, particularly with well, almost like my sort of wine library. Uh, we were given a bottle of wine, uh, Magnum of Barolo. We were, um, my wife and I were married in Barolo. Oh, and, that's um, awesome. <laughs> uh, yeah, awesome. Uh, and we were given this Magnum from the mayor. Uh, and so now it's coming up on, uh, I think it was like a 2006, 2007 vintage and Laura was like, Hey, you know, like we should, this wine's probably going to, it's coming of age. We should probably think about opening it up soon. I was like, yeah, but once you open it up and I was like, Oh, yeah. I'm not the perfect user of Coravin right now. I'm just going to check on it. <laughs> um, 
turns out it's in its drinking window. We're totally going to plan a dinner. But then I was like, what are the other sort of um, like quite very real legitimate aspects that may not have kind of occurred to you when, when you first started Coravin? You know, you've got your sort of bubble that you, and your reason for uh, producing oh, yeah. it. But what about um, like people that struggle with moderation? Oh, uh, so Corbin could definitely be used to drink less, but better. Um, as I get older, I find I'm doing that. Uh, so I have a per perfect glass of wine every night and I tend not to have two. Uh, I used to have two or three. So, you know, with Corbin, I could have as many as I wanted from as many bottles as I wanted. And, and in that sense, it, it, it inhibited moderation, right? And it, it, there was no hesitation between me and any bottle I had, uh, any night of the week. Um, but I've, I've moved toward moderation and drinking better with moderation. The, some of the very creative ways um, the wineries develop, they do recorking. Some of the Bordelais, for example, do recorking every 20 years. And they used to open up a pile of bottles and they'd find the one they'd want to top the other bottles up with. They'd find the ones that had gone bad and then they would top them up and then they would recork them. The bottles would be open for like 10, 15 minutes. And uh, and with Corbin, what they knew now is, and this started at Chateau Margaux, they'll Corbin across a range of bottles, find the one they want to top everything up with, pull the cork on that, pull the cork on the next bottle, top it up, close it, top it up, close it, top it up, close it. So the recorking changed. Uh, I see a lot of people who will test a bottle before they bring it to an event. Um, the wineries do this before they ship wine to an event. They'll Corbin them mm. to make sure they're not corked or off or oxidized. Um, one very inventive guy in California that I met, he's a wine consumer. And he was blending his own wines into his glass, right? He's like two thirds of this wine, one third of this wine makes my favorite wine. I was like, okay, okay but don't tell the winemaker. Um, I like, you know, you were talking about your anniversary. One of the things that I've done is buy a magnum of wine for an anniversary and, uh, we'll take a Corbin out of it right away. And we'll each yeah. write a note on the, that, on a, sticky label that we stick to the bottle and Amazing. then we come back to it we read that the next year on our anniversary and we'll take another sip and we write another note and so uh you know the the having a bottle with all of these the dates and the and the evolution of your relationship uh has been great i another interesting and fun use a uh, guy uh, lucas Paya, who worked for jose andres that's how i met him um, we were given a bottle of Pingus uh, by um, Peter Cisak, the, the, the owner. And he just gave us one bottle on a visit, right? It's a, it's a Shiner, no label, 2012. He gives the two of us one bottle. And so Lucas is like, I'll send it to you on Christmas. You send it back the next Christmas. And so we literally sent this bottle. Uh, he lived in D.C. So that was, and I was in Boston. We just sent it back and forth until it was done. We finished it together in California. That's magical, isn't it? Yeah, it was fun. And you can actually do that now. Like that's even a thing. Yeah. <laughs> in the it pandemic, seems to have been same thing. I'd drop Sorry. off bottles at a neighbor um, in the pandemic, right? They would carve them, and they would give me their oh, carving magical. bottles. And, yeah. Oh, that is magical. It seems that sort of technology, the ability to access wine inside a bottle, has been sort of kept by not uh, not intentionally, but. Um, the fact that just Coravin never existed, you know, Enomatic, for example, has been around for ages, exceptionally expensive piece of tech that centralizes people uh, at individual uh, outlets to be able to experience what an Enomatic experience would be like. Yeah. Or, yeah, you mentioned the recorking clinics. We sat down with Peter Gago from Penfolds only a couple of days ago. Um, you know, amazing human being. Love um, that guy. You know, talk, yeah, and talk, uh, yeah, it's hard not to. Yeah. Um, you know, talking about, how obviously the recorking clinics for him are the ultimate in um, uh, post sales service. Um, but yeah, uh, Corbin seems to have sort of, in a sense, decentralized um, a lot of this to, to kind of give the power back to the consumer. Yeah, freedom is, is what it's about. Uh, freedom of choice, freedom in the quantity. I wrote down a mission when we were founded. I said, you know, any wine, any time, without having to think about when you're going to drink from the bottle again. No matter what, what the closure is, still or sparkling, um, any wine, any time. And, uh, and we've gotten there with Pivot and Sparkling and, and Timeless. And now with Vinitas trying to make wine more approachable. Right now you have to buy 
a full bottle of wine when you're buying a mm. bottle. You know, what if you could buy seven 100 milliliter samples of seven different wines? Uh, I was drinking with the guys from Alkina uh, a while back, and that's what they're doing. You know, they're mm. fractionalizing their wines and they're shipping a set of their wines for the price of a bottle uh, out to folks to try. And, and uh, you know, if we can break the connection all the way down to being able to buy in a store a glass of wine that you take home, you could buy six or seven different glasses of wine and learn Amazing. six or seven times as much. I want people to be able to explore in the same way that I have and, and, and have that freedom from the point of purchase all the way through. You're obviously a tireless inventor. What? What's the wine industry missing right now? What's the, what are the, the big gaps that you've identified as kind of going, hey, this is something that the wine industry has slept on? Oh, it's a fiercely competitive market, the beverage and spirits world. Um, so everything else is sold by the glass. I think that's a big thing, right? Beer by the glass, whiskey tends not to go bad very quickly. So you can serve it the way you want to. It, there hasn't been a big enough push to single serve wine. Um, there are people that are doing it, uh, but not enough. And I think there's going to be a, a miss, a pretty significant one. And we're going to lose a lot of the younger folks to uh, ready to drink cocktails and beers and all sorts of other things. And they, wine is part of the problem of the vastness of variety is the complexity and the confusion, right? And so um, I don't want that to change, but I want the ability to explore it to become cheaper. Uh, at the point of purchase. So I think the more the industry can do to move in that direction, the better. The other thing is global warming. I mean, you can't pick up and leave when you're a winery. And, um, mm. and they're at risk, right? Uh, Champagne's going to be 14% alcohol uh, soon, if it isn't already. I was talking to, you know, even Ruinar has made a, uh, a, 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 what they call their global warming wine, right? They're picking it early and they're, they're hoping for the best. Um, so, you know, it's, I think, I think fractionalization down to the, to the glass when you sell it is a big one. Global warming is another, uh, and I, I simplification's hard and I, I don't, people have tried and it hasn't gone anywhere, but it'd be great to be able to make it simple. Otherwise people just, it's funny. I was talking to a guy at Waitrose in London and he said the average consumer of Waitrose over the course of their lifespan by six wines six different wines wow over their lifetime average consumer that's not a lot no and it's you fear. could you could you could multiply that significantly if they could fractionalize those bottles you could have yeah if they if they it's more like buying moments when you kind of think of it at that point they're buying six bottles because they're only bought, they've only got the choice to buy yeah. that bottle you could do easily do 36 different wines then and expand this sort of world yeah it's like a playlist on your phone right um you can put whatever songs you want from whatever bands you want. Uh, that's that's, that's the dream, if you could do it. Well, I was in our research, one thing that came up, and I always like, like I'm pulling out little tidbits from uh, sort of our, our research cycle, but uh, you mentioned uh, natural Pinot Noirs from South Australia. <laughs> How did that come about? What's your that interaction loved. with natural Pinot Noirs from South Australia? Okay, so a lot of surgery in Australia um, with my companies, and so I – gotten to fall in love with wines you guys drink all your best wines we we get we get the, the leftovers outside of the country and we see the odd you know henchke uh and penfolds uh but you know the average american thinks of it as high alcohol shiraz um very heavily on the eucalyptus side and 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 of course yellowtail which mm -hmm. is phenomenally successful um, not to knock those things, but you know, that's what we think of Australian wine. You go to Australia and everybody's like, holy crap, it's the best coffee. In the I was going to say, that's such a shame because Australian wine is so, that's such a disparity between what you see and what it is. It is the best. I mean, it's, it, I think, <laughs> I think Spain and Australia have the most innovative wine industries in the world, innovative winemakers in the world. And, uh, and, and I love that. And so I was at a wine surgeon friend of mine took me to East End Cellars in Adelaide. And part of my tradition is, look, I'm taking back six bottles, no matter what, every time I came out. And when I go to East End Cellars, I'm like, I need six different wines that you think I should drink. And uh, he gave me an Ochota or the... Uh, Ocota. Uh, Ocota. Ocota. I call him, yeah, I've always called him Ochota. 
and and Okota and uh, and he his wines were transcendent, and it was you know natural Pinot Noir. His, his Grenache is fantastic. His, he passed away sadly, um, but you know it, that shook me. Like I was like, that is not Pinot Noir. That is not what I've come to expect as Pinot Noir. Uh, in the same way that Commando G reeducated me about what Grenache mm -hmm. can be, Garnacha can mm -hmm. be. High altitude Garnacha from outside of Madrid is spectacular. It's almost blue in color. And 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 Okoda's wines are the same. They they changed my opinion about what natural could be, what natural Pinot Noir could be. And he was, you know, not variable. His wines were consistent. You know, he's he, mm -hmm. like the guys in Northern Italy. They, they, you know, Grodner, whether you like him or not, he makes the same wine. And each bottle is mm -hmm. the same. It tends, tends not to have a lot of variability from bottle to bottle, which is hard to do with natural. And so I fell in love with that. I mean, I, I also love Mosswood and, and Cullen. And, you know, I, I love uh, House of Eris and, and uh, Alkina I mentioned. Uh, Samiotti was another bottle that I took back. Holy yeah. crap. That stuff's amazing. Price of McKinley stuff's hectic. Yeah. Oh my very, god. Very good. Yeah. yeah. And, and I now I have like three bottles waiting for me in in Adelaide East End Cellars. You know, every time I go, uh, I pick them up right because they're allocated. You don't see them outside. Phrase is one of the uh, so we've got a a little side, like side business. One of our core businesses, um, a distillery, uh, and a lot of the time we're, we're sort of like the if. I probably could say this, where the distillers, the natural winemakers distiller of choice. Uh, <laughs> so um, if they've got projects that go awry, we tend to get the call up to come and, you know, distill it and turn it into spirit. Uh, Fraser <laughs> calls awesome. us up uh, and he, 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 you know, once a year he'll drop off some stuff to distill, not because, and this is the fascinating thing, he's the only one that does this, and I'm sure he wouldn't mind me sharing it, because he feels a wine might go bretty. Oh, he's yeah. not bretty. In fact, it looks incredible, um, and it's one of the hardest things as a distiller to, and, and winemaker to be able to grab something that is, in my opinion, like a hundred point wine, a thousand liters of it, and put it into a still because he thinks he thinks it might one day go bready. It just has this t super tight quality control. And Taras, you mentioned as well, Taras Okoda. I got to work with him in two thousand and uh, two thousand and twelve, um, uh, and yeah, absolute legend of our industry really broke down a lot of barriers especially between consumers and, and winemakers but oh. you're right in that sort of particular wine styles he he was making styles specifically for australian palates well That's something I, that aussie winemakers hadn't done for a while which was great and i met him in hong kong uh, just before he passed away a little while before he passed away and what was amazing was um he was walking out and the the show was still going it was like one of these big shows and uh and I was like, you're, and I mispronounced his name, <laughs> you're Okota. And he goes, yeah. And I love your wines. And he goes, great. Do you know them? And I was like, yeah. And he goes, wonderful. Can you man my table? I'm out of here. <laughs> so I was like, yes, sir. And so I'm Corbin guy. I've got my own table, but I've got a staff there. And I go over to my staff. I go, I got to go man this table. <laughs> <laughs> it was a blast. I'm acutely aware of your time constraints. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. Coravin opened a wine bar. I need to know what the hell that was. You know, we were in London. We wanted to learn. We wanted to see how our customers, what they were dealing with, because a lot of our customers are restaurants and wine bars. And, uh, and so we opened a wine bar uh, in Mayfair, 50 sparkling wines by the glass. We also wanted to show that that was possible. So we used Corbin sparkling, uh, and we had 400 still wines by the glass. Um, and what was amazing was, uh, we broke even after three months, uh, which is when our lease ran out, uh, we had three months to build it and then three months we ran and we sold every bottle of, of the 50 different sparkling wines. Sparkling became our number two to red, uh, to red wine. Um, it, if you, wow. if you, if you provide it, people will drink it. Uh, if you have mm. sparkling wines by the glass, people will buy it. Uh, and then our lease ran up and we wound up competing with one of our customers in London for the space. And we were like, we can't compete with our customer. We're out. And so we learned a ton. It was great. That's an amazing way to put your money where your mouth is as well, isn't it? Like to really yeah. prove that it can work. Did, did, would do you see an uplift in sort of the surrounding restaurants in, in, you know, taking up the new tech? London is the highest density user of Coravin on the planet. 
um, bar none. And so we we can't lift that. <laughs> they, they are they have more better wine than anywhere else in the world other than maybe hong kong um and so they and wow. they drink it by the glass we've got noble rot and 67 Pall Mall and and uh you know i, I could name dozens plan for comptoir and it, all these restaurants that have just massive wines wine lists 67 Pall Mall has over a thousand wines by the glass now um yeah wow. we, you know, we were just an also ran well, one last quick question is, what is next? Are we going to see another Keith Haring collaboration? Are we going to see more collaborations on that front? What's, what's, God, what's the go? I would love that. We have an opportunity to work with uh, the Keith Haring Foundation again. And, um, and I would love to. He was a street artist when I grew up in New York. As a kid, I remember seeing his paintings on the ground uh, and on the walls. Uh, I've got a deep respect for what he did and what his foundation is trying to do. Um, I may have two additional uh, artworks by Keith Haring on a core in my own house uh, that I would love to see launched. Um, and then we've had artists say that they wanted to make us unique capsule uh, capsules. They wanted to paint things for the labels on the capsules because we could do an artist series because uh, we just love art in general, right? The wine industry is also very charitable. So if we could find a charity, that'd be awesome. Um, you're going to see faster, easier, more fun, better. Uh, on our existing systems, pivot getting out to a year. Um, you know, the number one complaint that we have for restaurants is measured pour. If we can solve that, mm. um, where a measured pour is coming out of your hand, wow. you've got an in your hand. I would love to do that. Um, so there's a lot of innovation still coming. And then Vinitas, who knows where that'll go? Um, but we'll make it cheaper, better, faster. Well, Greg, exceptionally exciting. Uh, and honestly, I, I'm I love my Corbin. If I could buy even more, the Keith Haring one was one that I missed out on though. So I was, I was, I was particularly excited to see a little bit more. Well, of that. Wow, pretty fast. Yeah, it was, it was great. <laughs> I, it's still my favorite. It's the one I use at home. Uh, so I'll, we'll try to, there are none left. I'll, I'll, we're going to try to make more. Um, yeah. Awesome, and, mate. Uh, well, thank you, you know, for joining. Uh, certainly late uh, in the day for you, early in the morning for me. Uh, and hopefully we'll get a chance to actually come across. Uh, we're in Boston last year. We're, we're usually in the States uh, every now and then. So we'll be sure to try to try to link I'll, up. I'll, I'll be in Australia. Uh, so I'll let you know uh, when I'm coming down. Love your country. Awesome, brother. We'll catch you soon. Take care, Brendan. Thank you so much. Good job.